good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for taking time out for today's event. Uh, our speaker for today, Mr. Mohanish Pabrai, needs no introduction, uh, but I'll just say a couple of words about him. Uh, he is the founder and managing partner of Pabrai Investment Fund and CEO of Dhando Investors. He's also the author of two investing books. I would say two great investing books, uh, The Thando Investor and Mosaic, Perspective on Investing. Uh, he is also known in the value investing circle for paying about 650,000, 650K US dollar for a dinner with Mr. Warren Buffett, uh, which changed his life. Uh, and he is known uh, in student community for being generous with his time to share his investment with investing wisdom and learning. Uh, he runs his blog, uh, Chai with Pabre, which is regularly updated with all his content and all his investment uh, thoughts. Uh, so that's about him. Uh, before we start the event, uh, small heads up. Uh, let's respect this event, uh, uh, discussing just the investment philosophy, research process, and how Monish has developed as an investor over a period of time. Let's not ask uh, stock specific questions. Uh, it's an educational event, and let's continue that event in that spirit. Uh, with that out of our way, uh, with a, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mohanish Pabre. Thank you. You know, uh, pleasure and honor to be with you. Uh, it's wonderful. You know, LBS, one of the best schools, uh, best business schools on the continent, which is great. And uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll just go through a very quick slideshow. And uh, and then we'll uh, we'll go through a Q and A and pretty much any question is fine as long as I mean other than asking me what I'm buying right now and what we hold right now I think anything else is fair game um, I don't know if uh, maybe I'll ask for a show of hands I had I had done a talk uh, with the students at Boston College I do a talk with them every year so I'd done a talk with them I think November December last year. And uh, that talk was about the, the 10 commandments of investment management. How many of you, if you just raise your hand, have seen that YouTube video? Okay, we have some enlightened souls, which is pretty good. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna go through uh, what's in that talk. I think for the rest of you, you can, you can go through the talk, but just I think a couple of days back, uh, someone had, sent me a nice note where he took my 10 commandments and he said it in worse. And uh, he said that, you know, if you give things in worse to humans, uh, they have an easier time kind of uh, remembering it and, and it gets much easier to etch into your psyche if it's in worse. So I'm just gonna quickly go through the, the 10 commandments uh, the first one is commandment one, thou shall not skim off the top. Uh, and, you know, this one refers to not having, you know, management fees, having all the fees being performance fees. And uh, I won't really explain these. I'd say these are well explained in that Boston College uh, video. For those of you who haven't seen it, you can uh, go through that video. But I'll just go through uh, Johnny's take on these. So Johnny Bonner is the one who sent me the... Uh, revised commandments set in worse. So uh, his commandment one, the, the quantity of assets under your belt does not entitle big fees to be dealt. Then we go to slide number five, which is commandment two, thou shall not have an investing team. And, uh, and Johnny takes outsourcing investment understanding will result in a hard landing. Then we go to uh, Slide six, which is commandment three, thou shall expect, accept that thou shall be wrong at least one third of the time. And Johnny actually had two of these for this one. He said, an investment record winning two of three, a rich man or woman, you soon will be. And uh, also, as long as you're right a bit more than wrong, your lifelong return will likely be strong. And I think the second one actually is actually more true. I think that's correct. If you're even slightly more right than wrong, things will go very well for you. And uh, then commandment four, thou shall look for hidden P01 stocks, you know. And uh, I think Johnny does it better than I could. He says, a company selling for what it will earn in a single year 
if uncovered, will prove to be dear. Then we go to slide 10. Thou shall never use Excel. Of course, no one in this room ever uses Excel, so we don't even need commandment five. Good investment decisions do not need Excel's precision. And then commandment six, thou shall always have a rope to climb out of the deepest well. And uh, Johnny's take, you must prepare for times of despair, for when there's hope, for when there, hope is rare. And then commandment seven, thou shall be singularly focused like Arjuna. Maybe some of you are familiar with the Mahabharat. And Johnny's take, a man with focus will see through the hocus. And then commandment eight, thou shall never short a stock. And here Johnny goes wild and crazy. Knowing a company would fail, he placed a short sale. But what was under the veil was not the fail, but the time scale. This is what the Tesla shorts forgot. And then commandment nine, thou shall not be leveraged, neither a lender nor a borrower be. I'm, you know, paraphrasing Polonius and Hamlet. Uh, and we go to Johnny's take. You need, using debt to leverage a bet will make you sweat because of the threat that one day your obligations will not be met. I think that will sear it in a little bit better. And then the last commandment, which I think is the most important one, thou shall be a shameless cloner. And commandment 10, which actually I tweaked a little bit to make it a little bit better. Don't be ashamed to copy the best. After all, it is the road to success. Okay, so I think we whipped through those commandments pretty fast. But, uh, but like I said, if you want to get a, a, a full perspective on them, then you can uh, you can just uh, check out that Boston College uh, video on YouTube. And uh, with that, maybe you know uh, your questions. If you could tell me your name and kind of where you're at, where you're at in your LBS journey, and then your question, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, I'll start with the first question. Uh, before we get into the investing related question, it would be super helpful to understand how do you structure your day in terms of reading. What do you read? Who do you get your recommendation from? And how do you uh, structure uh, your reading material? Yeah, so uh, uh, that's a great question. And uh, um, actually, it is uh, it is quite opportunistic. There's no there's no game plan. So to take a step back, uh, one of the things I copied from Warren Buffett was uh, the power of having an empty calendar. And, uh, you know, Buffett has more than 80, he used to have actually more than 80 CEOs reporting to him, you know, managing more, more than a $200 billion portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. If you see his calendar, it's almost completely empty. Uh, I mean, I think he has more bridge games scheduled on his calendar than anything else in the, in the evenings and weekends. But during the day, he has almost nothing on his calendar. And and Charlie Munger is the same way. Uh, so these two guys basically built one of the largest enterprises on the planet uh, without being, you know, scheduled by the minute or any of that. And uh, the reason they did that was because they wanted a lot of flexibility and time to read and think and uh, to have control over their schedules. I mean, I think the, one of the most important things money cannot buy is time. And um, so the first thing is that, uh, uh, you know, the empty calendar is a side effect of being really good at saying no. So if you never get anything else from this talk, I think the thing that you should get is, I hope you get is, uh, being great at saying no. And saying no isn't easy. So, you know, I'll get I'll get emails from people saying, you know, Monish, big fan of yours. I'm coming to LA for a week from Australia or New Zealand. And uh, could I, 
meet meet you for coffee and you know of course the the request is perfectly fine because the guy is flying halfway around the world but i don't do any meetings with any humans other than warren and charlie without extremely compelling agendas uh and you know in that email there's no compelling agenda and so you know usually my assistant has all the if then else responses when these things show up so she does not even check with me and uh she sends the response that you know um monish is happy to meet with you at 5:30 a.m. at the south entrance just before the berkshire hathaway meeting on saturday may 4th other than that he's not available warm regards and um and you know a few people show up at 5:30 a.m. at the south entrance and so we concentrate all our meetings with humanity at that single point and place and time and uh, so that that works out pretty good so the first thing clean out the calendar i mean if i if i look at like my schedule this week i think this is the only thing i have on my calendar you know this lbs talk and uh, once the calendar is cleaned out then everything else becomes pretty straightforward so the priority with reading is if there is something i am actively researching or drilling down on then obviously i will set aside kind of general reading and uh, zoom in on that um uh, i i read uh, three newspapers a day so that that happens no matter what so the ft the wall street journal and the new york times uh and i read the physical copies of those paper in fact all my reading is physical uh stuff on paper i do not read on screens i also don't have um, uh many emails coming to me almost all the emails go to my assistant and you know she's able to handle most of them without any input from me and uh, a sliver of them that she thinks i should see etc uh i mean i get a folder on my desk at 11 am usually and that folder has all emails or anything business related that i have to deal with and usually some of you might have might have seen that my responses are handwritten and by 11:15 i'm done with that folder so emails etc are 900 seconds a day um and um and then the then basically you know uh, my reading is just a function of uh if i'm into investment research or some company which is what i'm doing right now then you know i i i put that on, on priority i mean the three newspapers a day are still happening and uh and uh and beyond that uh, usually all the magazines etc i catch up with on airplanes and uh, and uh, books i have a i have a large number of books uh, that i have in my library that i have not read i i know which ones i want to go at next and sometimes i'll you know change my mind i'll say okay you know let's go read completely different subject so when i'm looking for reading i'm quite open you know it could be a business biography uh, it it could be some kind of a philosophical book it could be a kind of wide range of stuff just depends on what is, what is of interest uh, to me at the time and uh, and that's how we take it from there but i think the important thing i think from all of you uh, because i think you have uh, the ability you're like wet clay you can adapt yourselves is uh, so one is you know get freedom from the devices so the beautiful thing is someone like charlie munger has yet to use a mobile phone you know so so forget a computer he has never made a phone call uh, on a cell phone or received one for that matter or own one for that matter and uh, and he definitely doesn't have a computer and uh, what that does for someone like charlie is uh, most of us humans cannot do it is he's blasting into 20 books a week a thousand books a year and uh, if you just remove the devices from your life and other humans from your life 
maybe you can get to five or 10 books a week. Uh, humans are a big waste of time. Um, all right, next next question. I'm Praveen. I'm a big master's in finance program at NBS currently. My question to you is, what comes to your mind when you first see a stock? Is it the gut feeling that comes first, first or the numbers that comes first to you? Uh, can you just repeat when you what you said after after first seeing a stock? What did you say after that? I'm saying, is it the gut feeling that comes first? Or, or the number that comes first. Is it what that comes, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Is it what that comes that first? That feeling, that feeling or intuition. Okay, well, okay, I didn't fully get that, but I'll give it a shot of what actually happens after I see a stock. So my objective whenever I encounter any stocks is to as quickly as possible, reject the idea so I can get back to general reading. Uh, so the model is not to find investments. The model is to find the flimsiest reason to say no. And as soon as I get to the first reason, I'm done and I move on. And uh, usually uh, two things work pretty well for getting rid of stocks really fast. The first is circle of competence. You know, you encounter, like, I mean, if I look at some pharma company or something, uh, it's gone. I mean, I, you know, I don't even need to look beyond the name. It's gone. Um, and the second is that if I, if I think I have some understanding of the business, then the second is uh, I look at uh, very quickly uh, the, the market cap, earnings, just some, some metrics on valuation. And I'm talking about less than 60 seconds. Um, and once I see that it's not at a P of one, uh, it's gone as well. So, uh, so basically, uh, we want to, or at least I want to get rid of investment ideas for the flimsiest reasons as quickly as possible. And let's say some, some stock uh, is really cheap. It, it appears to be within my circle of competence. Uh, then for one minute, I'll go to five minutes. You know, I'll give it five minutes. And again, to find something where I can just get rid of it. And if I cannot get rid of it in five minutes, then I'll give it 15 minutes. And all these exercises are designed, and designed to get rid of the stock as soon as possible. And the inversion of that is that I'm only looking for, if I can find two or three ideas in a year, I'm done. And uh, I mean, Justin, I think in daily emails, which I get in my folder, I think on a typical day, there are like at least three or four stock tips in that folder. And within the 900 seconds of processing the folder is those four stock tips. Uh, each of them gets, you know, 15 seconds because I just look at the company, I look at the price, and I very quickly try to see, okay, what is this guy saying? Is the money we're going to make on it? And, you know, a lot of times the stocks I get, oh, you know, it's trading at 10 and it's worth 13. And then, you know, there's a 40 page write up explaining why it's 13. Well, once I see it's worth 10, I say, okay, I'll, I'm going to give this human full benefit of doubt. I'll accept that it's worth 13. Uh, and he didn't say it's worth 60 with it trading at 10. So we're done. Move on. And uh, so that's how, so basically, be a very harsh grader on stocks. And the second thing about this business is, I don't, you know, you guys don't play pay baseball, but I think maybe you're familiar enough with the game that Buffett says, in investing, there are no call strikes. So, you know, baseball, three strikes are out. In investing, you can let 1,000 balls go by, 10,000 balls go by. You can let 95% of great investment ideas go by, and it doesn't matter. So there's always more balls being pitched at you. And uh, so if in a year you can find three of them, and, uh, and even after finding three of them, if one of them is, you're wrong on one of them, like one of the commandments says, that's just par for the course. It doesn't matter. If you're right two or three times, you'll be quite wealthy. 
the question was basically related to your uh, due diligence process. Yeah. Uh, when you look at a particular company and when you conduct your due diligence, what resources do you use? Uh, is it just the annual filing or you also hire third party consultants to conduct research? Or expert networks like GLG? So, here's one of the commandments. Thou shall not have a team. There are no humans needed to find three ideas to invest in. I have never paid anyone anything to do any any research of any kind or hired any third parties or any of that. All of those are Buffett violations. He doesn't do it, so if the guru doesn't do it, I'm not gonna do it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the scuttlebutt or the amount of time it takes or the due diligence to get comfortable with the investment, uh, that varies quite widely. Uh, I mean, it's been as short as three hours from the time I first ever heard about a company to a time I started buying it uh, to three months uh, where, you know, like I think when we made the investment in Fiat Chrysler in 2012, I hated that industry so much. I kept trying to find reasons not to invest. And after three months of digging, I capitulated uh, and, and bought it. And uh, it's been an 8X since then. Uh, so, um, so basically the, the thing is it, it varies. It just depends on the business. Um, the good thing is that if you run a concentrated portfolio and if you're going to make uh, two or three investments in a year, you have more than enough time especially if you're quick to say no and you don't spend time with other humans. Uh, you have more than enough time to basically do all the research you want to, um, you know, you know, even even uh, kick the tires as you want to and, and so on. So, uh, so that's the, uh, that's the Buffett model. And uh, so, you know, I think, Many of the things you'll hear or you'll see with uh, the way I operate, first of all, all of these were copied from Warren, so I didn't come up with any of these, but it is not the way the industry operates. Uh, the, and in my opinion, the industry operates stupidly. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, many things, no team, no management fees, um, doing all your own work, concentrated portfolios, all of these things, uh, you know, this is the path to nirvana. And uh, that's what you want to be uh, getting to, and that's what you want to be doing. Next question. About Buffett often talks about using a common yardstick in, ter in terms of a discount rate. Um, how do you think about that? Yeah, so, you know, the, the discount rate uh, is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I think if you, if we had a perfect crystal ball and which told us what the risk-free rate of returns going to be, uh, for the next 20 years, uh, then that would give you a basis to come up with a discount rate. Um, that would be the right way to do it, but we don't have crystal balls that tell us that. And uh, Charlie Munger also says that he's never ever seen Warren do a discounted cash flow. You know, I already told you, uh, thou shall not use Excel. I know that in your time at LBS, you have never turned on Excel, and I'm so proud of you. Uh, so, uh, so the the thing is that uh, we are not really going to fixate on stupid things like discount rates. Uh, what we want is obvious no-brainers hitting us over, a head, over the head with, in the U.S., what we would call a two-by-four, uh, you know, something you'd buy, buy at Home Depot. Um, so basically, you know, when I was looking at, let's say, Fiat Chrysler in 2012, 
I've never run a DCF. I mean, I think DCFs are, you know, for the for the birds. Um, I mean, the market cap of the company was five billion, and I thought in maybe five six years they'd make five billion a year. And I said, okay, why don't we just buy the company and hold it for five years, and let's see what Mr. Market will price this business at when it's making five billion a year. I'd really like to see it being priced at five billion then, and uh, you know, be the cheapest stock on the planet. And um, so that was the that was the extent of the DCF that was done. And uh, and so basically, what we're looking for is we're looking for very obvious no-brainers, uh, wildly mispriced, uh, severely undervalued opportunities. That's what we're looking for. And we want to be harsh greater than say no to everything else. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Sujit from India, and I'm doing my full-time MBA 2019 here. Uh, uh, you talked about your uh, investment process and how you analyze the companies and all that. So uh, can you uh, shed a little bit of light on how do you uh, do your exit process? Exits are a lot more complicated than entrants. Um, and in fact, I, I have a chapter in my book. Uh, how many of you have read The Dando Investor? Just raise your hands. Oh, we have a few people. That's good. So there's a there's a book, there's a there's a chapter in the book which talks about exits. And uh, so you might enjoy that chapter. Uh, but exits are 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 complicated. Um, and I don't do exits well. In fact, if I go back and look at my track record on exits, it's terrible. Usually I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. And, um, and, and part of the reason that happens is that, uh, you know, uh, the business looks, I mean, it's gone up a few times. It looks fully priced or whatever else. And then, uh, uh, something else shows up on the radar. So usually I've not been very good at exits. I'm trying to get better at it. But I think the simple the simple way to approach it is whenever you're buying a business, you by definition have to know what it's worth. So you know what the intrinsic value of that business is. And uh, typically, you know, when it's getting to maybe 90% of that value or something like that, uh, that's probably a good time to look at an exit. Now, uh, if it's a great investment, that intrinsic value will move up over time. And that's really what you're trying to do is trying to find these great businesses. So rather than buying discounted pies, it's a far better idea to buy growing pies. Growing pies are usually a lot better than discounted pies, even if you buy them at a lower discount. In fact, you usually will be forced to buy them at a lower discount. And if they're growing pies, uh, then typically intrinsic value is kind of increasing every year or every few years. And hopefully it always stays somewhat above where the stock price is, which means you can hold it for a long time. So that's, that's utopia uh, if you can get there. But I am not a shining example of being spectacular at exits, I, I still uh, want to get better at it, and I'm trying to get better at it. My, my question is, you have been in the industry for a substantial number of years, and you have seen how the technology has arrived. And uh, we want to know, is it possible going in the future to pick widely misplaced stocks, as you're talking, with the arrival of machine learning algorithms, uh, utilizing all the possibilities in the planet to identify all the mispricings? Is it going to be harder in the future? What is your viewpoint on this? Thank you. Uh, so I think that uh, humans humans vacillate between fear and greed, and that trait of humans is not going to change. And as long as humans are involved in equity markets, uh, even if you have various algorithms or whatever else involved, uh, you're going to see vacillations between fear and greed. And uh, 
So markets, um, uh, you know, there's a there's a book you guys might enjoy a lot. It's called Trend Watching, and uh, it's actually written by a TV anchor. Normally, TV anchors are useless authors. Uh, it's written by a TV anchor called Ron Insana, but in this case, Ron did a good job, and he chronicles like a very wide range of bubbles. And you know, we we are aware of bubbles. Uh, I've probably seen more bubbles than you have, uh, but but bubbles are around us all the time in different asset classes and different geographies. Uh, different things are getting inflated and deflated all the time, uh, simply because humans, that's how humans operate. And so we are, we are always going, and the other thing is that the valuation or you know, getting to intrinsic value of a business is part art, part science. Uh, it's not pure science. And uh, and so I'm skeptical about, actually deeply skeptical about the ability of, you know, automated AI algorithms uh, doing better or replacing humans. I mean, already we have a situation where we have index funds. And for most humans, index funds is a great way to go. It'll, be, it'll beat... 90% of human managers and so on and so forth, maybe 95% after fees. Um, so we already have a way to invest, uh, which doesn't particularly need much technology or AI or anything and gives you pretty decent returns. Um, but I think that, uh, that stock picking will go through its ebbs and flows. Uh, you know, markets get euphoric and stock picking becomes hard and they become depressed and stock picking becomes easy. I mean, that's, uh, that's just the nature of markets. And uh, so I think that will continue. And uh, uh, even if you have automatic things going on, as long as humans are involved. So humans have basically 17 year memories. And once you get past the 17 year memories, their memories start getting kind of faded and distorted. Um, and and we see some of that. So, for example, if you uh, if you look at the Dow the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1965 to 1981, uh, it's absolutely fat, flat. I mean, I think it was around 873 in 1965, and it's 873 in 1981. And in that period, from 65 to 81, the United States grew a lot. There was a lot of growth in the economy. And uh, there was a lot of inflation in the economy. And in spite of all that, uh, those two endpoints were identical. And then from 82 to 99, the, Ga the Dow goes from like, you know, less than 900 to around 12,000. And um, so we had one 17 year period, which is absolutely flat. And we had a second 17 year period where we were doing, I don't know, 16, 17% a year. Uh, great returns. And in fact, Maggie Maher wrote a great book called Bull, which chronicles this. And, and you see this in all markets around the world. I gave a talk at uh, uh, Trinity, Trinity College in Dublin, and I think that will go online in a few weeks. So I, the talk is about these long periods where markets do nothing, and then short periods or long periods where they just go crazy. So then if you look at it from 2000 to 2016, the next 17 year period, um, what I knew and actually when I was starting for Bry Funds in 99 is I was going into a period with a lot of headwinds uh, where markets were unlikely to do well. And that actually turned out to be the case. Uh, it still was fine, I mean, you know, my net worth is a lot higher than it was in 2000, so that uh, didn't, the, even with the headwind, it worked out just fine. Um, so uh, I think that uh, we are going to always have uh, vacillations in asset prices, and we'll have uh, underpricing, overpricing, um, fair pricing, all of the above 
uh, you know, way into the future. It's just the nature of uh, of the beast. And we're going to see it across the board. Like you, you've seen uh, pricing on Bitcoin, for example. I mean, uh, you can you can look at asset class after asset class. And if you go to Ron and Sana's book, you'll see that uh, these bubbles are just, I never thought bubbles were that common. They're, very, they're extremely common. They're just happening all the time. So my name is Akshay and I'm doing the Masters of Financial Analysis here at LBS. So my question revolves around management. Uh, what do you think, how do you look at um, management buying stock, especially for growing companies in terms of market share or earnings? where there's no sign of management purchasing stock. Do you still view this as a bad sign? Because I've read all the time that one of the key things to look for in a company is management buying stock. So how do you view that? Yeah, so share buybacks um, is like any other investment. Uh, management teams should buy back stock if their stock is undervalued. And when the stock is overvalued, it's a very dumb thing to do. And um, you know there are there are companies that uh, it's like clockwork. They they do buybacks every year. Uh, they don't really care uh, what the price is, whatever. I mean, if you look at a company like Coca Cola, uh, it's formulaic. They're gonna take a certain portion, proportion of the cash flow and buyback stock. It doesn't matter to them whether the co P is 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 500, or 1,000. Any of those numbers make no difference to them. And those humans who are making those decisions are extremely stupid. Uh, they're extremely good at running the business and they're very stupid about capital allocation, especially in terms of buybacks. And uh, we see that also, for example, uh, coming like MasterCard, uh, you know, so these are businesses that are the best of the best. I mean, these are very wide mode businesses, almost in indestructible and, uh, and such. And so they hardly need any money to run the business. In fact, Coke can run with no capital. Mas MasterCard can run with no capital. Uh, and and they gush cash, and so uh, there are really basically only two things they can do with that cash. Uh, they can issue dividends, which in the case of MasterCard and Coke would be a smart thing to do, or they can do buybacks, uh, which at present prices, I think, uh, especially for MasterCard, is very stupid. Um, but, you know, the thing is that the thing with uh, with public company CEOs. So the number one skill that public company CEOs have to get to the position that they got in is they're great sales guys. If they weren't good at sales, they wouldn't have been able to rise to those levels and convince all those people that they were the best thing since sliced bread. So, so they've got great sales skills. I'll even give them, they've got great leadership skills. They've got great management skills, all of those things. And they understand the, uh, the domain of their businesses and such. So these are the skill sets uh, that get you to be CEOs of large, large businesses. Um, very little of getting to the top has to do with capital allocation. Uh, so typically, we accidentally run into some CEOs who are great at capital allocation, and mostly we end up with uh, lousy capital allocators. And um, and and the, the the lack of great capital allocation skills manifest themselves in two ways in companies. One is uh, dumb acquisitions. You know, they 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 see some fit with some business and whatever, and that may or may not be the case, but when they look at those fits, they ignore price. And price is an important variable. Um, or, they, or you know, the, the reality is most acquisitions don't work. So, so the, a lot of money gets wasted in acquisitions and or it might be the right acquisition, it's the wrong price. And a lot of money gets, gets wasted in buybacks. So we, we should be buying back stock 
very heavily when the the business is severely undervalued. And uh, you know, a lot of these CEOs, if you ask them, hey, you know, uh, what do you have in your investment portfolio? And they say, oh, I don't, I don't do any of that. I've outsourced it to X, Y, Z. So you know, on the personal side, they don't think they have the skills to pick stocks, and on the professional side, they're, you know, pumping billions into buybacks. So that's just the way the world is. All right, next question. Uh, hi, Mr. Pabrai. Uh, you recommend all of us to be cloners and use platforms like uh, DataRoma to see what the smartest guys are doing. But could you give an examples of how being a cloner and using data roaming to see what the smartest guys are doing could go ter terribly wrong? Oh yeah, well things things go terribly wrong all the time, you know. This, that's just normal. Um, well, I think I think when we when we do cloning, cloning is a is simply a starting point of beginning research. Cloning is not that you go to Dataroma and five minutes later put in your buy order. Um, you would uh, get your head handed to you in that scenario, more, more likely than not. And from my vantage point, you would deserve to have your head handed to you. Uh, so that's that's fine. Uh, yeah, so cloning, uh, cloning is a very powerful model because what happens is that some investment, and this is especially the top two or three ideas of very smart investors. If some very good investor has a high conviction bet, uh, you know, it's already gone through one pretty significant filter where it's gone through their filter and they've uh, put their money where their mouth is, if you will. Um, and I think for us, if that is the universe from which we are picking stocks, that is a really kind of like um, shooting, um, shooting fish in a barrel. Um, it's you know it's it's a great it's a great uh, hunting ground. Uh, so so I already said that you know one in three times we're going to be wrong. So. It is, not, it is not etched in stone that if I clone an investment made by Warren Buffett, that I won't be wrong. You know, a lot of people cloned Mr. Buffett on IBM and they didn't do so well. Uh, so, so that is not a, uh, I mean, I think what you can do with a company like IBM is if Warren buys it, you could use it as a basis to start research and see if you come to some perspectives on what the intrinsic value of IBM is and whether it's uh, significantly different from what the stock price is. And, uh, and then see if that's the best, best opportunity in front of you. So, uh, so yeah, absolutely, uh, mistakes, uh, mistakes will happen whether you clone or not. Uh, but I think if you clone without doing your research, I think that's a very bad idea and it's probably gonna have a lot of negative consequences with, increased rate of errors. Uh, next question. Manish, thanks for your time today. Um, you changed your portfolio construction process in the middle of the credit crunch. How do you feel about that now in hindsight? And do you think it was the right thing to do mid crisis? And what do you think would have happened if you stuck to your original portfolio construction process, not just financially, but personally and emotionally? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't done the, the numbers of what would have happened if I had made no changes. Basically, what was happening during the financial crisis was that I was drinking from a fire hydrant. Uh, so while my portfolio was crashing and burning, uh, you know, I think we were down like 70%. Uh, there was a lot of incredible ideas, very cheap ideas to buy into. I mean, whole sectors had been decimated um and and like for example when i was looking at uh commodity stocks um one looked cheaper than the other i mean these were these are just absolutely clobbered uh valuations and uh and i actually they were coming at me so fast that i was drowning in ideas it was quite an orgasmic time uh 
Now, now the thing is that, you know, it was orgasmic, but you know, my own portfolio crashing and burning. I, I lucked out in the sense that I had one stock, uh, which was uh, Fairfax Financial, uh, which had large put positions on uh, on equity markets, and they had large CDSs, etc., that they had uh, uh, they had shorted, uh, and and so they their stock was just doing really well. Uh, while everything else was burning, so I actually took the opportunity to sell Fairfax, uh, which was which had gone up in price, and move that that money. And, and many times I sold businesses that were at three times earnings in my portfolio to buy stuff at two times earnings. So, in the financial crisis, I think it made sense for me to have a basket approach because I was I was going so fast. So, like in the commodity space, for example, we made a number of bets and we made them all two percent bets. And not a single one of those bets uh, lost money. I mean, we we had we had no we had almost no. I don't think I can't recall any stocks we bought in 2009 that ended up being losers. And uh, and many of those ended up being you know multi baggers five five x or more. And um, so it was a great time, and uh, the portfolio recovered pretty quickly after that. Um, I think that if if I encounter those times again, I would take a similar approach. Uh, it would just it would just make sense to do that because I couldn't tell uh, which of these picks would uh, would actually do better than the other, and there wasn't that much time uh, to research them as thoroughly as I wanted to because uh, the volume the volume of work. For me to sift through uh, ten commodity stocks carefully to pick the one that I thought was the best would have taken me months, and so I said I'm just putting two percent into all of them because I can't see anything that tells me that any of these have a problem, and uh, and that worked. Uh, in the environment that we're in right now, I think that uh, we we very rarely are not making ten percent bets. Um, because I think that uh, we're not able to find that much, uh, and so so when we do find stuff, what is happening now is I have enough time available to drill down as much as I want to, and uh, and we want to go to the max exposure once we uncover what we think are are great opportunities, and so 10% is the max for us, and uh, that's what that's what I'm trying to do now. So it's a it's just a matter of being flexible based on what the world is throwing at you. Next question. Hi, Monish. My question is on behavioral bias. So I just wonder what would be your advice to incorporate steps in our research process to identify and counterbalance our behavioral biases? Thank you. You know, I have to say that is probably the all-time greatest question I've ever received. What an incredible question. LBS hits it out of the park. Uh, so, uh, well, I mean, I think so the, the problem we have as humans, we have a lot of problems, but one of the problems we have as humans is our brains are a mishmash of ancient and modern, and the brain actually doesn't even understand what era we live in. You know, I mean, like, like my body believes that if I eat a meal, it believes that we don't know when or where the next meal is coming from. It doesn't understand that there is refrigeration and unlimited resources and supermarkets and everything else, and listen, don't make me store the food because trust me, my next meal will come in a few hours. You can you can take that to the bank, but the body don't understand that. It's terrible, and I don't know when it'll understand that. It might never understand that. So so we live in bodies and we live in brains. We live with brains that are not adapted to the circumstances that we are trying to deal with, and they're definitely they were never designed. 
to, to do equity research or to pick stocks. That is not the evolutionary trajectory that our brains have gone through. Uh, you know, so we have, you know, the ancient brain with the amygdala and all that, and then we have the uh, prefrontal cortex and all, which is more recent. And so um, I think, uh, you know, Charlie Munger spent his entire life um, studying quirks in our brains. I mean, that's that's the number one thing he's got the most interest in. And when I, when I meet him, He's always extremely curious about the nuances of specific humans. And, you know, these humans are nobody, you know, like it'll be some relative of mine I'm talking to him about. And he's, he'll drill down because he's, he's very curious about uh, the screwed up brains uh, of all these humans. And, uh, and so basically, so one is, how many of you have read uh, Poor Charlie's Almanac? Raise your hand. Okay, we have a few enlightened souls. That's good. So if you do nothing else, please read Poor Charlie's Almanac. I would say that Poor Charlie's Almanac, and I hope you excuse me for saying this, is worth 10 LBS degrees. Okay, if you just read and study that book, um, you will get more wisdom than I don't know how many college degrees that any place can give you. So I try to reread Poor Charlie's Almanac every year. Um, and every year when I reread it, uh, I could swear to you I find stuff that I've never seen before. I say, hey, you know, this is the first time I'm seeing this stuff. And um, so it has, it has many lifetimes of wisdom in that book. A lot of that wisdom has to do with misjudgments in our brains. And, and Charlie did us a huge favor. So the, the last talk in that book, which is the psychology of human misjudgment, which goes from page 440 to page 498, um, those 48 pages, probably the most brilliant pages ever. And, uh, and those pages are like a, a guide to how to navigate the world and how to deal with all the screw-ups in our brains. Um, and, and so the uh, human misjudgment and the way we, we are kind of quirky about different things, it is really important to understand that because it will give you a huge advantage in life massive advantage in life and it'll give you a huge advantage in investing um, so i'll give you i'll give you an example and you know uh, there's a guy robert cialdini who wrote a book called influence uh, some of you might have read the book but that's i think another book that i think uh, is up there uh, dealing with all the human misjudgment and so so just to give you one example of um, how our brains are screwed up so, you know, if you go back maybe 10,000 years or something, and you know, humans are living in kind of, kind of small groups, and some guy has extreme success at hunting, brings down a big beast, and brings it to his community. And he knows that there's no refrigeration, and he cannot eat that big beast. So he knows that he has to store it in the bellies of his neighbors. And so he calls the community, he says, look, look what I got for you. And everyone has a big feast, everyone eats, everyone's happy, and he freely shares with the others in the community. Then a few days later, when someone else brings down a big beast, they definitely invite this guy in. Because one of the things that, and this is going back thousands of years, humans have reciprocation tendency. And that reciprocation tendency is hard-coded in our ancient brain going back thousands of years because of this dynamic of 
you know, people being forced to share, uh, whether they wanted to or not. And, um, but there's a quirk in the wiring. The quirk in the wiring is that I will remember that John did me a favor by inviting me to eat when I was hungry. I'll remember that. But I will not be able to calibrate the degree of the favor. Favor. How good was the meal? How big was the meal? You know, how well did it taste? All of that sort of thing. All I can remember is John did me a favor. And I owe John a favor. Okay, so the human brain understands when someone does us a favor and it understands and it has hard-coded in the brain reciprocation tendency. What it does not have hard-coded is the calibration of the degree of the favor. And you can take advantage of that. And a lot of slimy sales guys take advantage of that. So, and I take advantage of that. So for example, when someone asks, you know, Pabrai Funds is mostly closed, but when someone asks, hey, I would, I would like to get information about Pabrai Funds, for example, most other funds deal with stuff digitally. You know, they'll send out uh, email and here's the documents and whatever else you need and et cetera. <laughs> what we do is, we send a physical package out. And the physical package we send out is uh, pretty high end in the sense that just the box, et cetera, I think costs more than $20. It's nicely designed. In the, in the package is a very nice cross pen. You know, probably a, I don't know, $25, $30 cross pen with our logo on it. And, uh, and it has my book and a few other things in the package. So what happens is that when people get that package, they feel good. Someone gave them a nice pen, you know, book to read, it looks good, everything's fine. They have now taken meat from me, okay? They've been fed. And they feel good about Monish. And they know that they owe Monish a favor. And the way the favor works is, I give you a $30 pen, you wire me $2 million. <laughs> And it might be like something like, uh, what happens is, if I like to study how humans react, probably one in 200 humans will send the entire package back. Dear Mr. Pabrai, thank you for sending the package. I looked at it, it's not of interest, warm regards. Send the package back with the pen because they are concerned that it's creating an obligation and they don't want the obligation. But to send the package back is a lot of frictional effort. You know, you gotta to go to the post office and all this nonsense, it's too much effort. Most humans, even if they have a desire to send it back, will not send it back. And once you don't send it back, you feel good about Monish, okay? And, and you feel like he did something for you, you gotta do something for him. And that's how the world works. So, so for example, that's an example of reciprocation tendency applied in the real world. And there are dozens of these quirks in humans. And uh, Cialdini highlights, you know, how these quirks can be used or have been used by different humans. So I think that um, it, it, it would give you a huge advantage in life. It would give you a huge advantage in marriage, a uh, huge advantage with all your human relationships. If you understood uh, the way we're wired. So for example, you know, I have relatives. And I used to, I, whenever I have like some disagreement with one of these relatives, I would kind of rationally present why I was right and they were wrong. And my rational arguments were correct, trust me, okay? But I never made any headway 
because that is not how humans process. Humans are not designed where if I tell you, hey, listen, X leads to Y leads to Z, and therefore we have these irrefutable truths. That means nothing. So Ben Franklin said, if you would convince, focus on interest, not on reason. So I changed my tactic. I was using reason. Reason is dumbass and stupid. Humans are not going to listen to reason if it's not in their interest. So I switched the conversation to interest. And I was shocked at the way I can just break through. So, so you have to understand that if you have a disagreement with a human and you're going through logical steps and arguments, good luck. That ain't going nowhere. But we can, if you get to interest, um, I mean, I mean, you see that you see that in the U.S.-China trade war. The U.S.-China trade war will not be sorted out with reason. Neither party will accept reason. They will accept interest. They will not accept reason. And so you have to switch that, and you have to think about it from that lens. The same thing with the North Korean. He's all about interest. He is zero interest in reason, you know, and, and on and on. So, um, so basically, I think the thing is that if you understand, so poor Charlie's Almanac, you, you have to read, read, read him a lot. But the last essay, uh, which actually wasn't a talk he gave, he actually spent a lot of time rewriting that, uh, Psychology Human Misjudgment, I, that is a really dense, almost 50 pages. I would like read that 50 times, you know, just to make sure and probably read, read it with some gaps because uh, there are many lifetimes of wisdom there. And, will, and if you can switch your mental models of how you approach humans once you understand, you know, kind of how their wiring works, it'll give you a huge advantage in life. Hi, Monish. I'm Sohit. Thank you so much for this. Um, my question for you is, for someone who would like to start his own fund, when, when does one feel that they're competent enough? Um, and also, just in terms of the investor demographics, who should we be essentially approaching for that? Sure. Sasri Kalji Sohit. Sasri <laughs> Okay, so... Uh... You know, someone asked Charlie Munger, you know, you gave your money to Lee Lu to manage. And that's the only outside manager you ever hired in your 95 years on planet Earth. Why did you do that? And how could you tell that this guy was the right guy to give your money to? And Munger's, Munger's response is that his approach to the selection of an investment manager is really simple. His first criteria is the investment manager needs to already be rich. And so Munger says, look, if you are a guy who is going to deliver above average returns, you should have been doing above average returns in the past. And if you're doing above average returns in the past, then, you know, the power of compounding with even small amounts of capital will make it into significant amounts of capital. So, Lilu, how many of you have heard of Lilu? A few people have heard of Lilu. All right. So, Lilu was a kind of a activist in Tiananmen Square. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, then he, you know, the Chinese government basically wanted to just put him away. And he somehow escaped to Hong Kong. And then with the help of some Chinese dissidents in Hong Kong, he made it to New York. And he joined Columbia University. And he did the three simultaneous degrees. He did a law degree, 
undergraduate degree and an MBA all simultaneously. So he's the only guy Columbia had who finished three degrees in four years. And, um, and he had no money, so it was all student loans. And he had about, as Charlie would describe it, about $20,000 of float of the student loan, which was, you know, money that came to him before he had to, you know, give it to the school or whatever else, housing, et cetera. By the time he graduated, just investing the temporary float that he had on the student loans, he had $950,000. So the 20,000 got converted to 950. And, uh, and then the 950, once he graduated, uh, that became several million. And then he started managing money and, I mean, it's a phenomenal record. I think uh, he's compounded in probably in the north of 20% annualized rate for, for a while, uh, maybe 20 years or more. Um, and and uh, so when Charlie met him, this track record was already there, you know. And so Charlie said, okay, it's a no brainer, you know, let's go. So if you are starting an, or thinking of starting an investment partnership, the first question you need to ask, answer for yourself is, are you a good investor? And the only definitive way to answer that question is your track record. So, you know, I always tell people that whenever they get going, they should set up a separate brokerage account, a discount brokerage account. Don't write your grocery checks from there. Uh, but just keep it separate so later it could be audited if someone wanted to audit it. And uh, do your investing in that account and see what the track record is and see how it compares to the indices, et cetera. I think that's the very first thing because even later when you go to, uh, to manage money, uh, so when, you, when you're looking to get investors to manage money, you follow what I call the three F's. You go to friends, family, and fools. And the most important is the fools. Uh, because, you know, you, you want to have a lifelong relationship with friends and family. Uh, so uh, anyway, so you go to the friends, family, and fools. But before you go to the friends, family, and fools, uh, you need to have convinced yourself that you are the best thing since sliced bread on managing money and hitting it out of the park. So I think in my case, uh, I had sold a portion of my business in 94, right, which was just when I was hearing about Buffett, and I had a million dollars for the first time ever, actually. I was, for the first time ever, I didn't have, I didn't have uh, credit cards and debt and all that. And, um, and so I did this million, which was, completely extra money, and I just was figuring out the Buffett model. I said, hey, let's take the million and see what we can do with it. Let's start investing it. And I think from 94 to 99, that million became north of 11 million. You know, well done, Monish. Well mm -hmm. done. And, um, and actually then there were a bunch of people who came to me because I used to just give my friends stock tips. You know, I bought a stock. I'd say, hey, listen, go buy this company. It'll look good. And they would make money, but they would not sometimes not see me for a while, whatever else. So they actually came to me and said, listen, all this stock tip business is random. Like some guy would say, listen, I'm worth 10 million. You give me a stock tip. I put 10,000 in it. It doubles, but so what? You know? So he says, so these guys said, said, came and said, we want more structure. So we want you to manage the money instead of giving us stock tips. So, I was, uh, I, I just thought, okay, you know, you can't really have an investment operation with one or $2 million. So there were like eight or nine investors that collectively gave me a million dollars. And, um, you know, these were good friends of mine. I didn't want to lose the money for them. So I, I made sure I followed all the Buffett rules. And I thought it was a hobby. I didn't think this was going to become a business. 
but then I think uh, a year in, I really liked the uh, the idea and the, well, I always enjoyed the investing process, but I said, hey, you know, uh, it's interesting, I have this uh, little bit of investor capital, uh, and I think it'd be fun to actually build this into a real business instead of treating it like a, you know, a hobby or a stepchild. So about 15 months after Pabrai Fund started, I said, okay, let's actually start, uh, you know, trying to get more investors and those sorts of things. And that was a, a very fun journey because I had to uh, work with within the, the limitation of SEC rules where, you know, you can't advertise or solicit or any of that. You had to actually rely on people you know and so on. But uh, but the bottom line is that if you deliver above average returns, um, like Buffett says, they will swim to you in shark infested waters in the middle of the Atlantic and give you money to manage. So uh, you can be a leper and you will get assets if you deliver the bacon. So uh, that's how that's what I would suggest. You know, do it on your own, prove it to yourself, and uh, after you've convinced yourself with enough years that you are actually good at it, uh, then we go to the three Fs and then we go from there. Hi, Manish Swati here from the MBA program. Just out of curiosity, what's the central theme of your discussions with Charlie and Warren at the AGMs of Berkshire? Okay, well. There are no discussions at the AGM of Berkshire because they're super busy. Uh, they have too many humans around them. So I don't have, I don't really have, uh, uh, well, I think I think Warren I used to see once during the AGM, but now I think I, I don't get to see him because he doesn't come for that event. Uh, Charlie I get to see a couple of times uh, briefly, but uh, I, I play bridge with Charlie every few weeks uh, in uh, in LA, uh, which is a blast. You know, it starts with lunch and then bridge, and uh, and I'll always have some 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 questions or something which I've been thinking about, which I'll uh, which I'll start with, and uh, I, I remember like one time I was going through the. Um, the old annual meeting videos. So another great resource is if you go to buffett.cnbc.com, uh, buffett.cnbc.com, it has the archives of um, all the Berkshire annual meetings, uh, video archives all the way back to 94. And those are an incredible treasure trove and they're annotated and so on. And uh, so what I've been doing for the last, I think last year is uh, while I'm getting ready, you know, shaving or showering, etc., I listen to about 30 minutes a day, and uh, and I have to say that the 30 minutes is sometimes the most exciting, biggest learning part of the day. I usually find that's uh, that's great, and uh, so I think I heard in '98, Buffett was saying that in his personal portfolio everything was in one stock. And um, so, you know, I'll meet Munger for lunch before bridge, et cetera. I'll say, hey, you know, Charlie, in 98, Warren was saying everything was in one stock. And, you know, what stock was that? And his language is a lot more saltier one-on-one -on -one than at the Berkshire meeting. And basically I get an answer, I have no idea, you know, for example. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, but then, you know, he'll take that discussion into a tangent and uh, uh, I think he was, I think when he was saying that, you know, I think that Warren, uh, Warren had, I don't know, less than, uh, I think less than 10 or 20 million uh, in 1970 when he shut down the partnerships outside of Berkshire Hathaway in cash. And that, that money has always stayed outside. That money now is over two billion. And so this is just the side bet, you know, that Warren was doing, not the Berkshire bet. And, and Charlie said that throughout that period, it was always concentrated, you know, 
mostly in two or three stocks. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes options, sometimes leverage, uh, but great returns. Um, so anyway, different different subjects come up during the during these uh, these sessions, and uh, it's a blessed life. Well, I think that that's tough because I think that most places you would look at, they're violating all the core principles. You know, so that's unfortunate. Uh, but I would say the next best thing once you accept that you're violating principles um, is what Buff Buffett says, which is you go to work for people who you like, admire, and trust. So I think one of the one of the uh, one of the mistakes a lot of people in your situation make, you know, people finishing business school and so on, is there's a lot of prestige with certain name brands. And so usually people are making decisions based on name brands or they're making decisions based on comp. And both are very stupid. So the job you want to take is the job you would do if you weren't getting paid. Uh, that is the ideal job. Uh, I mean, I, I would say if I look at my situation, um, you know, currently I'm at home, but my, my setup at home and my setup at work are identical. In fact, it doesn't make any difference to me when I'm working where, where I'm at. And if there were no outside funds, I would still have an outside office, just you know, have a little bit of change, if you will. There'd be almost no changes to my life, whether or not I'm managing outside money. It would all, almost everything would be the same. The investment process would be the same. Every, almost everything would be the same. And that is where you want to get to. So I think the most important thing is, you know, go to work for people you like, admire, and trust. Uh, look very carefully at the individual who's going to be your boss and the individuals who are going to be your peers. And both should be individuals that you highly respect and look up to. Uh, so that's really important. And then the the compensation of the name brands, those are irrelevant. So wish you all the best and uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, the good news of the video is we can edit a lot of this so it'll look a lot better than with the way it went through, but I, but I really enjoyed the session, so thank you. Thank you.